Hi there! Welcome to Board Games with Scott. This is a regular video series where I take a board game and explain it, briefly review it, and my goal is to help you determine if it's a game that you might want to purchase. This week I'm going to be talking about Battle Lore! This is a new game by Days of Wonder, designed by Richard Borg. It's a two-player game. It takes anywhere from half an hour to many, many hours, depending upon how complex your scenario is. It's a battle game where you have two troops on either side and you're going to crash into each other and see who is the most efficient in commanding their troops. It's actually a progression of a system that's been developed for a while. Uh, battle Cry started with and then moved on into Memoir 44 and Command and Colors Agents. And then this is the newest release of this, this game system is Battle Lore. It's a light war game. I know a lot of people are excited to see what this game is about, so why don't we open up the box and see what's inside. So what do you get inside that big box? Well, all sorts of cool stuff, but the first thing that's going to jump at you are these two big plastic trays of dolls. Miniatures. Figures. Whatever. Anyway, you get all these little plastic guys that you're going to use to move around on the board. Let's talk about these plastic trays for a minute. Now, they only open up in one way, and they've got little spaces for each guy with a banner. Um, but then they have the pit, and the pit over here is where you have bunches and bunches of guys all dumped in. The problem with this is that some of the guys ended up getting bent. So they got bent over in shipping because there's so many in there and because of the compression of this. Now, it does tell you on the Days of Wonder blog, you can go and see that you can put on a pot of boiling water, dip the figure in it for just a minute, pull it out, adjust it, and then put it in cold water, and it'll be fine. So that's something you can do to fix it. Uh, but they are crammed in there pretty tightly. Overall, this prevents your guys from getting snapped off, and it keeps them in reasonably good shape, all except for the bending over issue. You also get a board. The board is double-sided, but you're mostly going to be using this side to play the game. This side is actually set up for use in a Overlord-type scenario, where you take two of these boards together, and it makes one really, really big board. So you get a bunch of dice. Each die has the same symbols on it. It's got a red, a green, and a blue helmet, a black flag, a yellow shield, and a shiny purple lore symbol. Kind of like Lucky Charms the dice, you know. Black flags and yellow shield. Black flags, I don't think that'd be too tasty. Anyway, um, you get terrain tokens, which are big cardboard hexagonal tokens that have different types of terrain. This one has some water and wood that'll fit on the board. You get some bridges and fords and ramparts and other terrain features like that. Uh, you get some little chits of various types. Uh, these chits are used for your lore markers. There are other chips that will be used in other advanced features of the game. You get round discs, which help you indicate your cabinet, the people that you have in your cabinet when you're playing with the lore rules. And then you get cards, cards, cards. You get three main types of cards. One type are your command cards. And these cards are like uh, game cards you've seen in other games of this type. They'll allow you to command troops on the board, move two troops on the left, Troops in the middle, one troop from each area, things like that. That's the, the bread and butter of this game are these cards. Then you got the lore cards. Now these lore cards have a different background. And they have special abilities um, that are very different. They have abilities that are keyed to one of four different types. You've got warrior abilities, you've got mage abilities, priest abilities, and rogue abilities. Another thing that you get are these neat little card holders. So you can assemble them by slipping the tabs over the pieces. And then you can keep your cards so that your opponent can't see them. Very nice. And then you have a set of reference cards. Now, rather than make one big reference card, what they've done, and this is very clever, is they've broken up the rules onto these little cards. So you have one little card for your mounted units, and it gives you all the instructions you need for them. And you've got a card for your foot units, a card for each of the types of units, a card for each terrain type, a card for any special creature that you have. And so what happens is when you set up the scenario, each player just needs to get the cards that map to the terrain features, the creatures, and the troops that they control. So this is very clever. It allows you to easily introduce more rules. You don't have to introduce everything at once. You can just hand out the basic cards and work with those and learn the game and then add in more rules as you go along. So this is really brilliant. Each player has a court, if you will, when you're playing with lore, and I'll explain this later. You're going to use this card off the board to indicate which leaders you have brought on board and how strong those leaders are. And then you have the rule book. It's 80 pages long. This is a big rule book. The rule book is split into two parts. The beginning is just the basics of battle, and then it gets into more advanced rules. Um, during this video today, I'm going to talk about battle, and I'm going to talk about lore. 
but I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about creatures or special terrain types or things like that because depending upon the scenario you have, you're going to have many different special rules you use. The other thing the game comes with is a scenario book and the scenario book has a set of scenarios that add complexity to the game. So if you want to learn the game, what you can do is sit down, start with scenario one, and that'll have just some basics and move your way through. And by the end, you're going to have a full war council and you'll be doing everything. And so it's really a neat way to get into the game without being overwhelmed by all the rules. Uh, there's going to be a scenario creator available, so you can go online and actually edit the scenarios, make up your own. And uh, Days of Wonder is hoping to build a big user community with lots of user submitted scenarios. So that's all the components that come with the game. I should note that Days of Wonder went the extra mile in that all the cardboard chits were already punched and all of the miniatures were already off of their little sprues and put into the, the shells like this. Uh, and that's nice. That, that's an extra step. It sure cost them some money, cut into their profit margins. But I, that really was nice when you opened the box and you saw everything was neat, put away, and ready to play. This also means that they had to design an insert for the box that would hold all the components appropriately. Why don't we get on to gameplay and see how all of this works together. Now let's get in and talk about the gameplay. In order to understand the gameplay, the first thing you're going to need to understand are the banners. Now here's the way to look at this battlefield. You have one guy that has a banner and several other guys. Now the banner tells you what type of troop it is and how strong the troop is. The number of guys tells you how big the group is. And as your group takes hits, you're going to remove guys from the board. And the last person standing will be the one with the banner. When you kill that guy, then that comes off the board and that counts as a victory point for you. And the goal of the game is to get a number of victory points. That'll be determined by the scenario. Before we go any further, I want to talk about the, the banner system that really drives battle lore. Now notice that we have six troops here, all which have different types of banners. And the banners tell you a number of things. First there's the shape of the banner. The shape of the banner just tells you which side the troop is on. So one side is going to have the horizontal banners, one side is going to have the vertical banners. The color of the banner tells you about the strength of the troop and the speed of the troop. A green banner means the troop is going to be faster but doesn't hit as hard. A blue banner is in the middle, it's average. A red banner means it's someone that's stronger but slower. Then there's the symbol on the banner. The symbol on the banner tells you what type of troop it is. So the crossed swords tells you that it is a short sword troop. And then the miniature to which the banner is attached tells you whether it is a mounted or a foot unit. So you have horses in the game and these banners all come out and so you can just put a different banner in there. So by doing this it's become a very easy to customize system. I find it's easy to look at the battlefield and look at the colors and think about the strategies based upon that uh, because they've packed a lot of information into just a few different variables here that make for a really elegant system. So there's four basic types of troops that you've got. You have short sword troops, you have long sword troops, which are represented by the horse with the long sword on it. You have common bow troops. And again, for each one of these, you have the green, blue, red, and you have both sides. And then you have crossbow troops. Now this crossbow troop happens to be attached to a dwarven unit. There are also dwarven units and goblin units in addition to all the human units. So between all these different variables, it gives you a lot of flexibility with what to do in the game. Now the way this will work is on your turn you're going to play one of your command cards. You're going to have a number of command cards. Again, it will be determined by the scenario. Could be four, five, six. Um, later on when I talk about lore, there's another way the number of command cards are determined. But on your turn you're going to play a command card and then you're going to move troops and then you're going to fight. So on my turn I'm going to have a set of cards to choose from. Let's say I choose to play this card, Patrol move two units in the center. Now notice how the board is split by these red lines. So that means we're looking at just one portion of the board here. This is the left, this is the center, and the right's off the board. So this means I get to pick two of my units that are in the center, move and attack with them. So I pick two units to activate. Now I may choose to activate, let's say, these guys here, these red sword guys, and I choose to activate the blue sword guys. Now the first thing I do is I move all of my activated units, and then I attack with all my activated units. So the movement speed is going to be determined by the color of the flag. So I can see and I know that by looking at these little cards. I have a card that says foot units and this tells me for all of my foot units how far they move. 
I also have a card for mounted units that tells me my units on horses, how far they move. And then I have a card for each type of unit. So the cross swords on the banner tells me it's a short sword. So I'm going to look at that card when it's time to attack. But we're moving right now. So I might say, well, I'm tired of this little bowman here up on the hill who's firing down upon me. So I'm going to move these guys up to here. And I'm going to move these guys to here. Now, the green foot units get to move two spaces. The red foot units get to move one space. The blue foot units have a choice. They can move one space and fight, or they can move two spaces and not fight. Now, there's a reason why I didn't just charge them over here, and that's because your units are much stronger when they're touching. And I'll talk about that a little bit later, but that's a key component of this game, is keeping your guys together in formations. So I've moved my units, and now I can attack. Now, the way that works is I'm going to announce which attacks I'm doing. And again, the two units that I activated are the two units that can attack. Now, I notice that that archer is standing on a hill. So I'm going to have to look at the cards to see what elevated terrain does. And I can see elevated terrain. The elevated terrain card tells me to block, blocks line of sight, um, except from adjacent elevated terrain on the same height. There's no movement restrictions. And it also, most importantly, tells me down here what the limits are. And this tells me from out to in, I can only roll two dice maximum. Now, these guys are my heavy hitters. They can normally roll four. Again, that tells me here on this foot units card. That tells me how many dice I get to roll. I can see they move one and battle with four dice. But he's on a hill, so I only get to roll two dice to attack. So I roll my two dice, and I got two black flags. Now, if I had rolled a green symbol, that would have killed him, because a green symbol does one hit. If I'd roll an orange symbol, I'd have to look on the card to see what that does. With a short sword, for example, it gets something called a bonus strike, which means if I roll an orange, I do get to count that as a hit. The bow does not get that bonus strike ability. And so you have to read the card to see what's going on. Now, if I'd rolled the little purple shimmering symbols, that would do nothing in the basic game. If I was playing with lore, it would matter, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. But instead, I rolled black flags. Now, a black flag forces your opponent to retreat. Retreating means for every black flag, you have to move back one space. However, there's something else that's very important to talk about here, and that is morale. Notice how this fellow has two troops next to him. If you have two friendly troops next to you, you are considered to be bold. And when you are bold, that means you get to ignore one black flag from every set of dice that are rolled at you. So he would get to ignore one black flag. In this case, I rolled two black flags, so he ignores the first but has to deal with the second. So he'll have to retreat. So he has to retreat towards the other side of the board. He'll have to go either here or here. This one is blocked, so he'll have to retreat to here. If the retreat path is completely blocked, then you lose one troop for every black flag you have to deal with. So if this were the case and this space were blocked, then he would actually die because he has to lose one unit. That's all he has left, so he would die. But instead, he just goes there. Now, an advantage to winning a battle is that if you clear out the space in the area you're fighting, either because you completely kill them or you force them to retreat, you may choose to follow up. So to follow up, it's a free move from those people onto that space. This would actually be a bad idea in this case, because remember how I talked about being bold? Right now, when troops are in a triangle, they're all supporting each other, and they're all bold. And that's a strong formation in this game. It's good to stay within formations, because if you go out on your own, then you're very quickly going to get cut off, and you're going to lose the ability of being bolded. You're going to be retreated, and, and bad things happen. There's another very important ability that comes with being bold. And it's called battling back. If you are bold and someone attacks you and you do not go away, let's say that, that he managed to, to survive the attack. If you are bold, you may immediately battle back, which means you turn around and attack the troop that just attacked you for free. Battle lore is a melee heavy game. Uh, the ranged attacks don't make a lot of difference. They're fairly small. So it's really focused on melee and then some cards. I'd be at the end of my turn. These people have nowhere to attack, so they won't attack. They're just really supporting this big troop. I would end my turn. I would draw another card to replace the one that I played, and the other player would go. The other player would then play a command card, activate troops, move the troops, fight with the troops, and you go back and forth. And again, the goal is going to be to get a certain number of the banner holders. That's the goal of the game, and it'll be determined by the scenario how many of these you have to get to win the game. Let me talk a little bit about mounted troops. Now, mounted troops, the guys on horses, what they can actually do is they move faster, 
So the green ones move four spaces, the blue ones move three, the red ones move two. So he could move, you know, da -dun, da -dun, da -dun. he could move up to here. And then they get to attack with three dice. If the mounted troop on their attack manages to clear out a space, not only do they get to follow up if they wish, but they get to do what's called a pursuit. And a pursuit means they get another melee attack. Again, if they manage to clear out a space because the person has to retreat or because they kill them all, then they can choose to follow up. If they choose to follow up, they may attack again through a pursuit. If they manage to clear out another space because the people have to retreat, they may follow up into the space, but they do not get another attack. So that's pretty much what there is to the basic back and forth game. A few notes that I've, I've found from playing. Protect your weak troops. Once someone gets down to just the banner holder, you want to get them out of the front line because then they're easy pickings for someone else. And in fact, you can use them as a, as a lure to lure some troop to come into your back line and then you jump them and beat them up. Um, so make sure and protect your, your weak troops. Watch the effects of terrain. So for example, in this case, I know that the wooded terrain makes it so that only two dice can go in and two dice can come out. These little archers are weak. They only fire with two dice anyway. So they can be in the woods and it's not going to make any difference. But if this big strong red troop comes in, they're only going to get to roll two dice against these little archers because they're in the woods. So that's an advantage of doing that. Something else I should say about archers, actually. Now, archers have a range of, the basic archers have a range of four. You have to look on the card. It'll tell you that on the common bow card. It has to be a clear path between the center of their hex and the center of the hex they're attacking. And they cannot have another enemy adjacent to them. So in this case, because these archers have this group right here adjacent to them, they cannot shoot over here. They're fully occupied with this group, and they must attack this group if they attack. If this group were back one, then the archers would be able to shoot at this troop. There's a lot of things that block line of sight. Forests and hills and other units all block line of sight. Archery is not particularly strong in this game compared to melee. Let me talk about a few of the advanced rules before we go on. There are creatures. The creatures are big, tough units. They have special abilities. They're harder to hit. You have to actually roll a successful hit twice to kill them. And they have some abilities in moving, but that's an advanced rule. You can look into that when you decide to get into creatures. Another set of advanced rules cover different races. In the box, you get goblinoids and dwarves. The dwarves have the ability in that they are always bold, so they don't have to have support to battle back. The goblins have an ability to uh, rush into combat to attack, but they're also frightened. You know, we have bold as a morale, there's frightened. And when you're frightened, whenever you roll a flag, you have to move back two spaces instead of one. Again, there's more rules with these. These are part of the advanced rules. I just want to briefly introduce them here. And these do come with the game. Other rules cover all these different terrain types. There's rules for waters and ramparts and all of that stuff. Again, as you get to each scenario, Take a look at what those do. Each one changes the rules of the game a little bit. So this is your war council. And this is how you're going to unlock the lore part of battle lore. So what we've talked about so far is the battle part. That's the basic combat. And then as you go through the scenarios, in about scenario five or six, you'll be introduced to lore. Now the way lore works is each player gets a chance to set up their lore cabinet. You have five different main positions we're looking at. Commander, Warrior, Rogue, Wizard, and Cleric. We're not going to talk about Creature and Guest. Those are advanced rules like the Big Spider and things like that. We're just going to focus on these five. Now the way it works is that when you're playing one of the more in-depth scenarios, each player will have a number of levels to distribute between these five slots. You indicate these slots by using these discs. And so you can have people at, at no level, meaning they're not represented on the cabinet, a level one. And then what you do is you just use the back here as a raise to so take them up to level two, for example, or level three. These levels are not going to change during the course of the scenario. You're going to set it ahead of time, and that's going to determine your power. Now, the way it will work is you'll have so many levels to split amongst the five roles. So if you have, for example, six levels, you may choose to take everyone at level one and one person at level two. Or you could choose to take just the uh, commander at level three and a wizard at level three. Depends upon whether you want to be really good at a couple things or more of a generalist. Now the commander level is going to determine how many command cards you get in the game. If you don't spend any of your levels on the commander, you're only going to have a hand of three command cards. Those are the basic troop movement cards to have during the game. 
If he's level 1, you get 4 cards, 2, you get 5 cards, and level 3, you get 6 cards to play with. So you can determine if you want to have more military strength by putting more levels into your commander. The other types of leaders will help you to use cards of that type. And many of the cards are dependent upon the level of that leader. So if you want to have a level 2 rogue, then you'll put a disc there, that's level 1 rogue, and then you flip over one of the other discs, and that means you have a level 2 rogue. So you may choose to start the game, for example, with a level 2 commander, a level 2 rogue, and a level 2 wizard. Your opponent may choose to have a level 3 cleric and a level 3 commander. So he's going to have much more of a military presence with some healing. You're going to be sneaky with lots of spells, not quite as strong militarily. And then this determines a number of things. The highest level that you have is going to determine how many lore cards you get to start, how many lore tokens that you have, which are the currency you use in order to actually use the lore cards, and the maximum number of lore cards you can have. Now, when you add in lore, you do everything you've been doing up to this point. You play a command card, you draw a command card, but then you have a lore action. The way that works is, at the end of your turn, you may either draw two lore cards from the deck of lore cards and discard one, you can draw one lore card from the deck and take one lore token, or you can just take two lore tokens. Now, the lore cost on these cards is indicated up here, and it ranges from one for some basic things, to five, six, there's 13 for a really strong one. And the cards are going to give you a lot of information. They're going to tell you how much it costs. They're going to tell you when to play it. Like this one says, for example, play alongside your command card, which means you're going to spend seven lore tokens and play this alongside your command one. It'll tell you the target. In this case, target all ordered units. And then we'll tell you the effect. The targets roll plus one dice in melee for the whole turn. Also, for each lore roll to hit is scored. Now, this spell, it doesn't matter what level your leader is. It's going to have the same effect. For some spells, though, it does make a difference what level your, your lore master is at. Like this lore drain costs two, play alongside your command card, target is your opponent, your opponent immediately loses one lore per level, plus two lore, back to the lore pool. So that can really screw with your opponent who's been gathering things up. So that's wizard abilities. Now the rogue abilities, they're things like pickpocket, where you get to steal lore from the other person and bring it to yourself. And terrified, you roll dice, and for every flag or lore roll, the person has to retreat. So that's a way to really screw up their lines. The warriors are going to be strength, plus one die in battle, plus three in ranged combat. You can move an additional space. Pretty direct, just combat abilities. And then you're going to have cleric abilities, which many of them are, are nature, commune with nature. You could ignore terrain movement. Uh, divine terror makes people run away. Blinding light, minus dice in battle. So they tend to be more defensive. The way you set up the lore deck is based upon the lore masters present on each side. If both people have the same lore master, then you put in 14 cards of that class. If there's no lore master of that type on either side, you put in 5 cards of that class. And if one person has it, you put in 8. So the idea is the mix of the lore deck will be based upon the sort of leaders that you have, but it's very possible you will draw cards for which you have no leaders. You can still play them, but you have to pay 3 extra lore when you do. Now the ways you get those little lore tokens, there's several. Again, at the end of every turn, you can take up to 2 depending upon how many cards you draw. Whenever you roll that lo little shiny lore symbol in battle, you get a lore token right away. Whenever you kill a creature that the opponent has, the big creature, you get a lore token. And there are cards that give you lore as well. Generally, the way that it works when you're playing with lore is you get some lore cards, and then you begin to save up and plan to use those lore cards. Because there's some lore cards that are, have really big impacts on the field if you've planned out how to use them. So you get the cards, then you plan your troops around, and then you play it for one big massive turn, and your opponent says many, many, many bad words. You play your side differently based upon the strengths you have, and this, to me, is really what makes this game exciting. The ability to customize this lore council, play different cards with different abilities and different strengths. It makes certain cards more valuable to one side or the other. But this is a really neat addition to the game. Well, that's battle lore. Oh wait, battle lore! There. What do I think about this game? I really like this game. Now, I should say I didn't like other games in the series. I, I, did, I have Battle Cry, I didn't care for it, I didn't tr like Memoir, I just the games didn't work for me. And so I sat down and didn't expect to like this game. And I really like it. I find it's engaging, it's easy to play, the system has obviously been well refined, it's very smooth to play. The banner system makes for interesting decisions, it allows a lot of depth without a lot of confusion. Uh, because there's only four main troop types, but each troop type having the three colors adds a lot of depth. But you don't really have to know that much about it. You just know, oh, the green ones are fast, the red ones are tough, 
and the blue ones are in the middle, and that helps you think more about what's going on in the battlefield. Um, this game for me is a solid A. I'm a may I'd, I'd actually go. I'm gonna go A plus on this one, and the plus comes from the design of the instructions in the scenario book. The rule book is fantastic. It's richly illustrated. They really spent a lot of time making it make sense. And then the scenarios are designed so that you can play them slowly and pick up the rules as you go along. So you can play each scenario and it will add a little bit more and a little bit more. The way that they broke apart the rules onto those small cards, so you don't have to have one big card with everything on it. Instead you have this card layout with your rule summary. Again, that's brilliant. They've done just a fantastic job with the design of this game. They went overboard in punching everything. There was no cardboard to punch out. It all came pre-punched. All the miniatures were off of their sprues. It was really nice. Um, so I'm going to give this game an A with an A+, plus for all of the effort that they went to make this a great experience. <laughs> Hurrah, Days of Wonder. Maybe other people can take that as an example. I'm really impressed. So, enough gushing about the game. I really like it. Uh, I've, I've had a lot of fun with it. It is a two-player game, so you have to decide if you can work a two-player game into your schedule. I'm going to be curious to see where this goes in the future. I predict big things for this game system. So with that, I'll thank you for coming. If you'd like to see more videos like this one, head over to BoardGamesWithScott.com. All of the Board Game with Scott videos that I put on my website are released under the Creative Commons uh, Attribution Non-Commercial Derivatives License, which means you can go out, you can pass this along to other people as long as you keep the attribution of where you got it intact. Which means if you're giving someone a gift of a game, you may want to consider burning off one of my episodes onto a CD and give that along. That way they'll be able to get into the game more quickly. So with that, I'll thank you for coming, and I will talk with you in a future week. Bye-bye. It's, I'm going to be talking about Battle Lore! I'm going to be, I'm going to be talking about Battle Lore! Ooh, it's like a special effect. So cheap. Anyway. <laughs>